Actually, I had a group called the Crescents uh, in 1955, and we recorded in 1956. And uh, we did a little touring, local touring, but uh, I worked with the Five Satins that did In the Still of the Night. And we also worked with uh, the Heartbeats, did some work with the Five Tones. And those, those jobs were at the Audubon Ballroom in Harlem, New York, and also at the uh, State Theater in New Haven, Connecticut. And, uh, and then, of course, then that, when that group broke up very, very quickly, we formed The Elegance. And The Elegance, we went on tour with our first record, uh, which was Little Star. And um, the first date I did was in Worcester, Massachusetts, White City Beach, with Fats Domino and Ricky Nelson. Well, we, used to, we, we were very, very interested in, in seeing who was going to be on the shows because we were big fans at the time. But Little Star had been number one. Little Star shot to the number one spot almost immediately and uh we had a little we had a little bragging rights at that point so i thought we fit in somewhere along the line but over the year over the months that followed we worked with buddy holly with the, the coasters the platters the drifters we worked with clyde mcfatter uh ricky nelson was was a it was a you know nice guy we had a good time with ricky bat stamina was fantastic and um so it, it was a little awe you know we were awestruck to a certain degree at one point, we actually shared a uh, we shared a suite, a double suite, and the common area in the middle was uh, where we would hang out. The Everly Brothers were in one room, and we had the other bedrooms. And uh, in the middle of the the middle of the boat, the common area, we would hang out. You know, in between the you know the, the nights and days that we were there, we were at the Brooklyn Fox Theater for ten days with Alan Freed, who at that time was the guru. You know, so we did meet quite a few people uh, during that that heyday. And uh, it got to be more of a, a friendly situation. Dion and the Belmonts became very, very close with us. And, uh, and again, uh, Dwayne Eddy, I mean, you could name some of the icons. Uh, we signed with ABC Paramount when we were only 17 years old. And uh, Paul Anka, Steve Lawrence, Lloyd Price, um, Ray Charles. So we had the opportunity to meet all these people at a very early age. And, you know, being fans, with most of them because their records were out and in most cases maybe only a couple of months before we now saw that you know that we get to get to see the individuals and then when we got on the bus so we started traveling we realized they were just young kids and like us and all of a sudden the common bond was there and you know the the hairiness was gone you know the scary part was all gone and we all became friends so it was good it was a great time well, the one thing that I know is I probably worked with every one of them at one point or another in the last 61 years. But I, I, did, the, uh, did, I did the cruise, I believe, two years ago, and uh, that was a complete, complete shock because now I was working with artists of the 60s and the 70s, and those were acts that I had never worked with before. And you get to see a whole different perspective. Now I almost became a fan, you know, more than a peer. So that made it a little more interesting. And uh, now I work with the stylistics and we started working with, you know, people like that. I mean, all of a sudden I took two, three steps back, you know, and uh, I loved every minute of that, too. So uh, albums were just at the point of, uh, of that part. Don't forget, we were literally pioneers in this music. And uh, there were very few acts were making albums. But the first two albums or three albums I remember buying were the Cadillacs, the Flamingos and the Spaniels. And most of the kids in the area, when you started listening to the early rock, you became, you became very, very intrigued by the black artists. And I would never even, have, I never ever bought a record by a white artist because I would think it was like it was betraying my, you know, my, my feelings towards the music. Never knowing that one day I was going to be one of those people that I betrayed, you know. So, but I did, I did follow them quite early. The Heartbeats were my favorite. Heartbeats, the biggest record was a thousand miles away. And when we first put the group together, we actually took a record of theirs and found the address on the bottom of the label. And we made that the first stop that we made to audition for a recording company. And it was Hull Records. We walked in there, we sang, we auditioned live, husband and wife owned it. And uh, they actually liked what they heard and gave us a contract to take home and have our lawyers and parents take a look at it and um, see if we were interested in signing with them. They had some, they had three acts that I know of that had that sweet melodic harmony. And, and, and one of them obviously was the Heartbeats. 
Another group that they had signed them was the Pastels, who'd been so long. Um, another group was the Avons, had a song called Baby. Those were so beautifully done, their voices were like silk. And they told me at the time that my voice was very melodic and very flowing, and that it fit into the package that they would like to uh, represent. So we did, we signed with them. When we recorded Little Star, they said that they realized that the record was bigger than they thought it would be, or it would become bigger than they thought it would be, and that they didn't have the distribution to carry it to the level that they thought it would go. So they sublet us to ABC Paramount. That's where I met Ray Charles and Paul Anker and, and the rest of the guys. And we actually signed, we signed with them and the record was released on their subsidiary called App Records, APT. And the song shot to number one like almost immediately. So we, we literally found ourselves, uh, you know, right in the catbird seat right off the bat. Radio. Funny story. <laughs> I, uh, I was a clown in school. I was not, uh, I was not uh, you, know, the, you know, the perfect student, but I always was a clown. And the bottom line was I found myself going to summer school every year. When the record came out, I was actually in summer school, my final year. And as I was walking out of the, uh, out of the school in uh, Staten Island, the oldest fellow in my group had just turned 19. He had a car, his father's car. And he pulled up in the front of the, uh, the, the, the walkway when I was coming out, and he had a little star blasting on the radio. And he's yelling, Vito, Vito, the record, the record. And I just literally said, goodbye school. <laughs> Got in the car and I was thrilled to death. I just it wasn't even about money. It wasn't about fame. It was bragging rights in the neighborhood. We just wanted to be big shots in the neighborhood, and never knowing that it was going to continue like that. It wound up. Our first our first trip was in uh, actually the tour though, or out of out of the area was I should say, or out of the country, was in Hawaii because Hawaii in 1958 wasn't even a state, and there were no jets. So we went eight hours to California nine hours from California to Hawaii on a turbo prop. When we got there, they landed on a tarmac. There were no chutes. We come down the stairs on the tarmac. Little Star was the biggest selling record in the history of the Hawaiian Islands. They closed all the schools and we had a thousand kids down on the tarmac waiting for us. And it was amazing. And that's the day that I realized that I'm in the business and I love it and I want to stay here for the rest of my life. As far as the prom was concerned, or when there were proms and everything in the school, I never went to a prom, my prom, because obviously I left before, you know, I was actually uh, in my senior year. Uh, but I did, we did over the years sing in, in a few proms, especially in the neighborhood where, you know, everybody knew, knew us personally. So we would do it. Matter of fact, I've got a picture on my website of, of a young kid that was maybe 13 years old or 12 years old at the time. And... Uh, his real name was Carmine Granito. And this kid, we sang at his prom, his father worked with one of my guys. And he introduced us. And we took him to our rehearsals and he got mesmerized with music and he got hooked. We took him to one of our, stu our sessions after, after, after a year, we took him to our second recording session. But that little 12 and 13 year old boy changed his name to Ron Dante. And Ron Dante became the producer of most of Barry Manilow's hits and became the singer on all the vocals on Sugar Sugar. And Ronnie is uh, still a very close friend. We see each other quite often. And um, talented, talented young kid. And uh, his family stayed close with us until he lost his mother and father. But I still see some of his cousins and aunts in the old neighborhood. Well, you know, it's not like Brooklyn. Staten Island was a unique borough. And uh, at that point, we, we didn't even have, uh, I, I don't know what the actual population was in the 50s, but. Uh, I, I would, if I had to guess, I would say maybe 120,000 people. Now there's 480,000 people there. But the bottom line was that nobody was singing at the time except a couple of locals. Nobody actually had any success or, or any kind of recording success uh, from, you know, that I know of. There was another group called The Secrets. They recorded a song for Decca uh, called Queen Bee, uh, and, and, but the song didn't do, didn't do well. And then they broke up. Um, another group called the Majestics, uh, which that name has been used by quite a few acts. But again, local guys. And we would sing at all the local dances, or the church, the church socials, and so on and so forth, or the church dances, I guess. And uh, so we did have competition amongst ourselves, but not to the level where, you know, where Little Star took us. 
A um, couple of guys did very well in other areas. Um, there was a there was one of the guys from the neighborhood. I just spoke to him the other day. His name was Louis Russo, and Louis changed his name to Gianni Russo, and became one of the actors in the original Godfather. He played the son-in-law, Carlo, in in the in the Godfather, and um, you know he's still doing well. And he says that you know when he saw that we had the number one record and we would had this national international success. He made him a believer that it could be done, and it was an inspiration for him to do what he wanted to do, which was to be an actor. I, I still live on Staten Island. I really, did, I don't see any reason to leave. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 10 minutes from Brooklyn, five minutes from any section of Jersey with the three bridges. Uh, I'm 20 minutes from Newark Airport, um, an hour and a half from, from Atlantic City. You know, everything I want is there. It, it's parks, the most parks in all in all the five boroughs. A good place to raise, you know, kids. I raised my my children there. My grandson now has become my whole life. I'm, you know, so it's a, it it's it's got the feel that I want to spend the rest of my life there. I don't want it to change. My mother passed away two years ago at the age of ninety nine. Still lived in the old house that I that I lived in, and was still independent. Was still lived there by herself. You know, so uh, you know we would just make sure and check in at time to time. But very very active and. Uh, you know, so the neighborhood was still there. My cousins are all there. My uncles, or whatever, whoever's left, still lives in the area. My my friends from school still live there. I still, my best friends are still guys that that I grew up with from five, six years old. So it's just too many, too many, uh, too many hooks, you know, there for me to want to go. I can go anyway, anytime I want. So, you know, it's good. Oh yeah. Actually. Uh, one of the things we all did when we got our first check, everybody ran to the car dealership. You know, Jimmy, who's still with me today, the, one of the, the only originals still with me, two have passed on and the other has health issues. But Jimmy went out and he bought a pink Thunderbird, 1959 Thunderbird, he bought 58 Thunderbird. And uh, I bought a 57 Oldsmobile, best car I ever owned. It was a black 98 long, which I put a Continental wheel in the back, made it even longer. All the toys, I had every toy you can imagine was on that car. And people would actually come drive in the neighborhood and be in awe to see that car. It was that pretty. Um, I mean, I really, today I've had, I've had Jaguars, Mercedes, Cadillacs, Lincolns, et cetera, et cetera. Not that I'm bragging, but no car, no car gave me that feeling like that 57 Olds. Loved it, loved it. I got, I got a unique call years ago, uh, I believe almost 30 years ago. Martin Scorsese was filming Goodfellas. And I got a phone call that he had seen a movie that we were in. It was, it was a, uh, a movie called Joey where we were doing some singing on stage. And of course the movie didn't, didn't do well at all, but it was like on three o'clock in the morning on, on cable and he must have been seeing it. And he had his people contact me the next day and I auditioned for a part. That time I had a full beard, I was carrying a full beard and um, the part that he wanted me to be was a wise guy. And, you know, those who know the little intricacies with the mob world, wise guys don't have facial hair, you know. So he told me I had to shave it off. I said, uh, I don't want to shave it off. I'm not an actor, you know. So he said, what do you mean? I did a movie. Is it going to be a big movie? I, I, I'd rather not do it. So the next day they called me back and gave me another part, which I didn't have to have the beard taken off. So I actually had a part in Goodfellas where the main scene was the Billy Bats murder when Joe Pesci kills Billy Bats. And Billy Bats was my was my boss in the movie. And of course, they killed him. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I guess I didn't do a good job as a bodyguard. But um, I didn't hear from him for 30 years. I got a phone call not too long ago, two, about a year and a half ago. They wanted to know, and on my resume it said I spoke Sicilian, because my, my father had passed away at a very young age of a kidney disorder. My mother refused to go on welfare and went to work. We moved in with my grandparents. So actually, I learned to speak Italian before I spoke English. Well, on my resume, it said I spoke Sicilian. So they contacted me if I would teach Bar uh, Rob De Niro and also uh, Joe Pesci to speak Sicilian for this new movie, The Irishman. So I wound up speaking to them, and I, call, I got the call to go in and uh, <coughs> teach Robert De Niro and Joe Pesci how to speak Sicilian for the movie. And while we were doing it, uh, Martin Scorsese said, you're not going to be on the set when they do it, you know, so you can watch that they do it properly. So I might as well give you a part. So he gave me a part as a restaurant manager for a, a wise guy in Philadelphia, which the restaurant is still 
operating today. It's called the Villa de Roma. And um, I actually became the manager of this restaurant. And from there, you know, I actually got a part in the new movie, The Irishman, which will be opening or will be opening, you know, fairly soon. So it was it was an experience. And, and the biggest thing that really thrilled me with that was during one of the sets or during one of the scenes, Martin Scorsese walked across the room, stopped in the middle of the room, grabbed his chin like this, turned to me and he said, Vito, you got a minute? And I says, oh, my God, he's going to cut another scene out now, you know. And I walked over and he just started tapping me on the chest. He said, what's the name of your second record? I was in shock that he even knew, you know, my records, never mind 50s records. Yeah. He, I says, please believe me. Ah, that's the one. I love the intricacies you do with your voice. Great song, great song. Let's go on my trailer. We'll talk about music. And he, 100 people in a restaurant, he said, let's take a little break. And I went in the trailer and we talked 50s music for the next 45 minutes. Amazing. I mean, great. What a feeling that was. And he's such a nice guy. I mean, really a legitimately nice guy.